Today, I want to talk on the subject of the gifts to the church. We talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Today, we're getting into the gifts of the church. The dogs are going off because somebody just... They just heard somebody outside. All right, so Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. And he himself, he gave some to be apostles, some apostles, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man and the cunning craftiness of the deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow in all things in him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined in it together by by whatever joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. See, the gifts of the church is not man's idea. The gift of the church is God's idea. God started the church. Who is the church? We are the church. The church is not some building someplace. The church is every single believer of Jesus Christ. The church was not man's idea, but God's idea. He placed Jesus as the head of the church. Jesus gave gifts to the church. The apostle the prophet, the evangelist, pastors, teachers, gifts are exactly that. They are gifts. Have you ever given a gift to somebody? Because pastor gives this example. Have you ever bought a present for a child? And it costs a pretty penny. You sacrifice to be able to bless the child with the toy that they really desired, you wrapped it, put a bow on it, and then brought it to the party. The child opened it. Then he looked at it. And threw it in the corner, or worse, broke it on purpose within the first five minutes. See, Jesus, see, we are doing that same exact thing to Jesus. Jesus gave gifts to the church. These gifts in many local churches are thrown into the corner... Broken, misused, and simply abused. What is the purpose of the gifts of the church? The purpose of the five-fold ministry gifts. They are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Equip means furnishing, equipping. So God gave the church to equip us. He gave these gifts to equip us, to prepare us. The responsibility of all ministry gifts are the same. Each one has a different anointing, a different purpose, a different use by God to do their responsibility. But they are called to equip the body of Christ. The job of the church is to prepare us, to prepare us so we can go out to do it. That means giving them the tools to do the work of the ministry in today's church mindset. Many believe that the ministry is the job of the fivefold ministry gifts. That is why they pay them a salary. No, it isn't just the job of the fivefold ministry ministry. It is the job of you. It is the job of me. It is the job of every single believer. Why? We've all been called to go out and preach the gospel to the lost. Whether we are working as a janitor, you can lay hands on the toilets, on the sinks, and all that, releasing the anointing and the power of God into those things so that anybody who sits on them can feel conviction. Or 
maybe you work in the store. At your break, you can get your co-workers saved. You can go out and get people in the store saved. The truth is that if the five-fold ministry gifts are not empowering you to do the work of the ministry, then they are not fulfilling their purpose. If you are not being trained to do the work of the ministry, then the person does not have the gift, but she is a hireling, a hired hand to do what you want them to do. That is why I am against drive through chapels or drive through churches. They are not doing the work at all. They are just pacifying you all the way down the hill. They don't even do the next thing to bring the church into the unity of the faith. Does that mean we are all growing on or agreeing on everything? Absolutely not. But the job of the fivefold ministry gifts is to bring us, is to get us focused on the unity of the church. Where we see unity in the word, we always see a massive outpouring of the love, the power of Jesus. Lives are changed, healed, and get set free. Why is unity important? Because we are the body of Christ. When we are unity, we are moving together to get people saved, to get them healed, and to and that allows great revivals, great spiritual awakenings. Every time we come into unity, an outpouring of God comes into being. Why? Because we are now moving as one. Does that mean we're agreeing on everything? Of course not. But it means that we are moving together. What is unity? The ministry gifts are to bring us into agreement or unity. These are There are so many diversities. How can unity ever be brought? That is simple. Salvation. See, segregation is wrong. Why? Because segregation brings diversities. It means there is a diversity in something. And every time there is a diversity, there is not unity. And where there is not unity, God cannot bring an outpouring. And I actually heard R.W. Schambach last night in something that I was watching talk about that is a spirit. Segregation, diversity is a spirit. Why? Because it removes unity. And I'm not just talking about black, white, and this whole entire racial nonsense. Because yes, that is wrong. There is a demonic spirit behind that. But the same demonic spirit is causing the church to be divided. Why? Oh, well, I don't agree with the pastor on this. Oh, well, I'm a Baptist. I don't agree with that. Oh, I'm a Methodist. I don't agree with that. Forget the job titles. Forget forget the denominational titles. God never called a denomination. He called the church. And the church is the B1. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. The unity is also for every local church. Each local church should have a vision. The ministry gifts should bring the local body into unity with the vision of the specific house. If your church does not have a vision, it, it don't know where it's going. It's impossible to hit a target or it is hard to hit a target that you can't see. It's impossible to hit a target you do not have. If you don't have a vision, you don't know where you're going. You can't see where you're going. And if your church does not have a vision, can't come into unity. Why? Because nobody knows what direction the church is going. You have to have a vision. And when you have a vision, you can bring bring people into unity to aim towards that target. And once you're aiming towards that target, God can do great outpourings in that local church. 
to bring in the unity. Or not to bring in the unity. They bring the church into maturity. The fivefold ministry gifts are to teach and train the body in the word. To bring us into a place of maturity. We have way too many Christians who have been born again for 20 years. They are still in diapers. It is time to grow up. If you've been saved many years and you're in the same exact place that you have been, it's time to grow up. Hebrews chapter 5, 12 through 15. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And they have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone can, everyone who partakes of only a milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who for reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If the ministry gifts are fulfilling their call, they will be teaching the word so that the body of Christ will bring will become mature in the relationship with God. But they should also be able to give instead of always having to receive. We are to be growing up into Christ. Maturity means growing up in the Christ. The word perfect means mature. We are to be matured into Christ. Your church is not doing that. Doing these three things. It is not a church. It's a social club. It's a place to, where you go and try to agree on everything. That is not a church. That is... And none of these three things can be done in a drive through church. It cannot be done in a church that don't know where it is going... And it cannot be done in a social club environment. Your church needs to be doing the three things. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That means even equipping you to take where they leave off. To where you don't need them all the time. In many churches, they like feeling needed. The pastors love feeling needed so they don't do the job. And that type of church, get out of they are to bring you into unity and into maturity. And many churches don't like doing those things because it completely makes them feel unneeded once you grow up. And that means that pastor himself is not grown up. We have defined or so have even subtracted the gifts of the church in a strange manner. Each one has the same exact responsibility. Equip, bring to unity, and bring to maturity. One anointing is different. But the true be a ministry gift. One anointing is different, but truly be a ministry gift these manifestations will be evident. So, I think Pastor might have had a typo there, but what he is actually trying to say is God uses us in different ways, but they are all each a different ministry gift. Or not ministry, yeah, ministry gift. Apostle, pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist. Some have extracted the apostle and the prophet saying their ministry ceased in the first century. Now, first off, no, they didn't. If the first two out of Ephesians 4.11 were extracted, then how strange that this verse, Paul did not make it clear. If in Today's church, we can exclude two of the five, even though they are in the same verse. Then what is next? It 
it is all or nothing. We do not have the right to distract or add whatever and whenever we want to. This is Jesus' church, not ours. These are his gifts, not ours. To keep or throw away. All or nothing. We need to be all or nothing in this. If any of these gifts have ceased... Then why didn't God tell us? Oh, well, the prophet is no more. Oh, the apostle is no more. That was just for the first century church. Oh, that was just for the Old Testament times, which I heard when I was a Baptist when it came to the prophet. But that is not true. All gifts are active today. Why? They all have a purpose in the church. These gifts are not vocations. Excuse me. Dogs! Enough! Dog, forgive me, the dogs are being annoying downstairs, barking at someone that when it's actually across the street. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 17. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity. It is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Some ministers go into this as a job, not a calling. That is bad. It is not a job. It is a calling. If you are not called, don't go. Why? Because God want, might have you for the marketplace. He has, pro, he, if you're not called, he wants you in the marketplace doing something else to reach people there that only you can reach. But when you are called, now you are exactly where God wants you to reach those people and to even prepare others to go and do the same. Even in the marketplace. The word is, talks about this clearly and calls them hirelings. 1 John eleven thirteen. I am a good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd... One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep, scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. When you are called, you will care so much for your congregation, your sheep. Why? Because you love them to the point you would even lay down your life. A hireling would not do that. Oh, well, I am here just to preach on Sundays. I am here just to do this. But that is not... But the other things is not my job. Bull crap! When you are a shepherd, you will go all out for the sheep. Even me, who is called to be an evangelist. My job is to go out to get... To get the... Not, to reach the pastors or for the 99. Me as an evangelist, I'm called out to reach the one that has either strayed off course or that nobody would go out and reach. That is my job. So let's begin to start breaking down these gifts. I might have to finish Monday, or not Monday, but tomorrow. But we'll see how far I can reach today. I had trouble with the, trying to do this broadcast earlier. So I restarted it. So far, all is good. So, the definition of the apostle. The sent one. One of establishment. Founding. The gifts of the apostle is the only one that can work within all the other gifts at the same time. So an apostle can be a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist. And, a, and prophesy as a gift and not just in functions. 1 Corinthians 12.12 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you 
with all perseverance in signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. There are three tiers of an apostle. Calling. Three tiers of apostolistic calling. One is Jesus, and Jesus could only actually fulfill the, this one. He is the first and great apostle. Romans 1.1 1, 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Ephesians 2.20 Having been built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. All right, have him been. All right, let's retry that because I kind of got myself a little bit confused in that one. Ephesians 2.12 Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay, Hebrews 3.1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of the, our confession, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ was an apostle. Jesus is the chief apostle. He established the earth. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. That's how we know Jesus was there at the, at the very beginning. So you see the Father. You see the Son which was mentioned right here, and you see the Holy Spirit moving up on the waters. He established the church. Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome them. I will build my church. Jesus said that clearly. I will build my church. So Jesus is the builder of the church. There is only one chief apostle, and that is Jesus. He is the first and the greatest apostle. The next one is the twelve apostles. These are the second tier apostles. These were the initial twelve apostles that were chosen by Jesus, except for Judas. The disciples were under the tutelage of Jesus. They were pupils of Jesus. They walked on the earth with him. He was establishing, teaching, and developing them to launch his church when he was taken away. The initial criteria of being an apostle are found in the books of Acts. So this is where we begin to start seeing. There is an actual thing that you have to be able to settle in to be an apostle. My uh, my pastor himself is an actual apostle. I know another apostle, Apostle Charles Endathon. And they fit this criteria. Acts 1, 21 through 22. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us in all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. There are only one exception. There is only one exception to this rule, and it was only generated once in the scripture. That was the Apostle Paul. Second Corinthians eleven five. I consider myself that I am not all inferior to most eminent apostle. Paul learned under the direct teaching of Jesus when he was driven to the desert for three years, Galatians 1, 17 through 18. Nor, do I go, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 years. Paul wrote and helped and established the church. But even Paul yielded to the authority of the apostles in, in Jerusalem. So yes, not everything there, apostle, my pastor or apostle Charles Zendifan, they weren't tier two apostles. They were the next one, 
which it is under today's apostle. But first, let's read Acts 15, 22, which talks about Paul going to Jerusalem. Then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church, the and chosen men of their own accompany to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. Romans 1.1 1, 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So now today's apostles, let's get into them. The apostolistic ministry of today is not one of establishing new doctrine. All doctrine has been established through the twelve, plus Paul, and no new doctrine is to come forward. The apostles of today are those who are sent to establish churches, ministries, and organizations. The responsibility is to then so solidify, train, and mature the church and leaders with sound doctrine. Training leaders is one of the main responsibilities of an apostle. This is an anointing, anointing not a vocation. You are not hired into this. This is a calling. Their responsibility is to equip, bring to unity, and bring to maturity with local with the local church and with leaders. So all of this is the apostle. Their main purpose is to build churches today, to equip the saints and to bring them to unity and bring them to maturity. So they go around planting churches, train up leaders, and all that. And they and and all this, they move in all the other gifts. Apostle prophet, teacher, evangelist. All of those. Evidence of a true apostle. 2 Corinthians 12.12 12. Truly the sign of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. They will establish and oversee workers. So an apostle will establish and oversee other people. And of course, P Apostle Charles and Nafan does it. My pastor himself does it. In today's church, many call themselves apostles, yet they are there are no miracles. They have a church of fifty and oversee no other workers. They are not a true apostles. They are not a true apostle of the kingdom. If you were, were, there will be signs that follow. You will oversee others. You will definitely have more than 50 people because you'll be constantly reaching more and more and more people. And on top of that, you will be overseeing others as well. And you will also work in the miraculous so, now let's get into prophets. Now, now, let's get this straight. This isn't talking about, like, Moses, Elijah, and stuff. Yes, they were prophets. But today's prophets move in, in a completely different way. They're used in a completely different way. Why? Because you don't need... God to talk through them to you. But you can actually hear from God himself. And prophets, if they give you any word, it should already go with what was already told you. Now, many people feel, oh, well, I was used. Oh, well, I'm obviously a prophet. I was used in prophecy. No, that just means you're a believer. All that means is that you were, are a believer and the sign of a believer was there. A prophet, if you are a prophet and you're called to be in a prophet, you will fall under what we're about ready to discuss right now. So, pastor has this to say. I remember in Bible college being afraid when a prophet would come because I was scared. 
He would pull me in front of everyone and tell every one of my issues. I did not want to be near a prophet for this reason. Sadly, that would be a horrible thing. That would be a horrible thing to call a gift. So, you don't have to fear any prophet doing that to you. A prophet would never do that to you unless it was absolutely needed and God tried everything else and had no choice but to do it this way. The prophets of the Old Testament are different from the gifts given to the church by Jesus. They are used differently. Old Testament prophets... To remember, to remind us all, God did not speak to people like he does today. The people did not have direct communion with God. We have direct communion with God. And I'm going to end with the prophets and then finish up the gifts of the prophet or the gifts of the church tomorrow. God spoke to his people through the prophets. 1 Samuel 28, 19. Now Samuel said this all. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Now, there are many different people trying to say, Oh, well, this wasn't really Samuel. It was a familiar spirit. He went to somebody with a demonic spirit called familiar spirit. And then you have other people say, No, it was indeed Samuel. Now, whether it's Samuel or not, I mean... Chances are, it could, because the person freaked out, it could have been actually Samuel. But then again, there is a good chance it's actually Samuel, and that's why the psychic freaked out. I mean, it could be a familiar spirit. It could be Samuel. That's not the problem. And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore neither does neither by prophets nor by dreams therefore i called you that you may reveal to me what i should do now we do know that in that portion it does say that saul got killed for contacting a familiar spirit or a medium or whatever so through that could be true biblical evidence that it was a familiar spirit but then again who's the we'll find out when we get to heaven all right so Haggai then Haggai Haggai 11 1 through 13 then Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people saying I am with you says the Lord second Corinthians 21 12 through 15 and a letter came to me from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord, your father David, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat, your father, or in the ways of Asa, the king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the king of Israel, and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot like the harlotry of the house of Ahab, and also have killed your brother, those of your father's household, who were better than you behold the lord will strike your people with a serious affliction your children and your wives and all the possessions and you will become very sick with the disease of your intestines until your intestines come out by reason of sickness day by day oh that's a harsh word jeremiah 23 1 through 4 Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and have attended to them. Have attended to them, not have attended to them. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds. And they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up the shepherds over them, and I will feed them, and they shall bear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. The prophets directed the people in the God's will. First Samuel twenty two five. 
Now the prophet Gad said to David, Do you do not stay in the stronghold, depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed, went into the forest of Heroth. Second Kings three fourteen through sixteen and Elisha said, The Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand. Surely where were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played, and the hand of the Lord came upon him. He said, Thus says the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. The prophet's responsibility was to declare the future. Isaiah 7:14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, that was talking about Jesus, Zechariah 11, 12. Then I said to them, it is agreeable to you. Give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out my wages, 30 pieces of silver. Daniel 2, 31 through 35. The head of gold represented the Babylon era, 609 through 539 BC. The chest of arms silver represented Melido, Persia era, 539 to 331 BC. The belly of the hips of brass represented the Assyrian era in 331 through 167 BC. The legs of iron represented the Roman era that would split into 168 BC the 476 AD the feet of iron and clay represented the revived Roman Empire which is happening today 476 to now so that was all that the New Testament prophets really did so let's let's see if I can finish up what today's prophets the New Testament prophets are to do because the blood of Jesus and the certain of the Holy of Holies ripping in two we can all enter the very presence of Jesus and be directed by him. Mark 15, 3 through 8. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now what is interesting about that veil is it was very thick. No one could actually rip it. Only God himself could rip it. And since it said from top to bottom, well, nobody could really go into the Holy of Holies. Except for maybe one priest each year. Which means that thing being torn, since it was, I believe, the time for them to go in, God must have left just a little piece there to say, hey, look, this isn't vandalism. I did it. Okay, so. We are not led by prophets. We are led by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit, these are sons of God. Sadly today, not many people are led by the Spirit today, but are now led by their flesh. So, We are not to be led by prophets. We are to be led by... Oh, right, I already did that. We are led by the Spirit of God. The prophet's responsibility is to confirm what the Lord speaks to our heart, which I already said. Or when a prophet does speak a futuristic message, that it will witness in your heart. Paul, an apostle, wanted to go back to Jerusalem, but when he knew it would be but he knew it would be a very bad situation. Acts twenty-one. 12 through 13. And when he heard these things, both we and those from that place pled with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, 
What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am not, I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. Now, this didn't exactly happen. This imprisonment that Paul ended up going through, he was eventually set free. And then later on, again, arrested. And then that is when he died, which we don't read that in the book of Acts. But that was Paul's first imprisonment and the second one was worse because he was actually bound up and instead of getting what he got that first time which we see in Acts where he got a rented house he actually got put into a dungeon and eventually beheaded. He was warned by people being led by the spirit in verse 4 not to return to Jerusalem but Paul confirmed that he knew if that in his heart in verse 12 through 13. Agabus the prophet came to him again and confirmed what Paul already knew because he was spoken by the Spirit of God. Acts 21 10 through 11. As we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Man Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he told he took Paul's belt, bound his hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So here we see the future being prophesied, but it always confirms what is already done. So the prophets today is to tell you what you, the Holy Spirit has already told you, thus confirming that you are still in right, going exactly with the plans God has planned for you. And when a prophet does speak a futuristic message, it is important to go into prayer and not to act on it just because the message came. They might be prophesying page 10 and you're only on page 2. Wait to be led by the Spirit and it will come to fruition when it comes time. Another responsibility of today's prophet is to come into the local church or if they are a are a national or international prophet it is to bring the church back into alignment so if the church gets off alignment the prophet tweaks it back into alignment to correct the body of christ from foolishness and misdirection from god's plan the prophetic even through correct though corrective at times should be encouraging and edifying the responsibility of the prophet to the body is to equip and to bring into unity. So notice something. Two things. Two, two different minish gifts to the church. Same exact responsibilities. Just used in different ways to do it. So, pastor actually knows a guy who is strong in the prophetic. His name is Ted Shuttlesworth Jean senior the father of ted shuttlesworth jr and this guy is so spot on with his prophecies he he was actually he's actually one of pastor's mentors or grandfather in the spirit all right they also carry a voice to the whole world concerning the foretellings of events and things to come all these prophetic utterance must align first with the word of God. And pastor says, this reminds him of the, the 84 reasons Jesus was coming in 1984, which obviously did not happen. That was a year when he was graduating high school and he was praying that it would, that he could at least graduate. People told their or sold their homes, quit their jobs, and gave their wealth away. And um, obviously Jesus did not get the memo from the Father because he did not come back. And Pastor says, says um, Jesus didn't get the memo from the Father, I guess, I guess, because nothing happened. Here it is, 2018. Jesus still hasn't come back. 
Why is that? Well, the Bible tells us why. God is waiting till he has waiting because he wills none should perish. The role of the New Testament prophet is different from the Old Testament prophet. And pastor wants to make it clear. To make sure we are not creating the mindset of the prophets in the New Covenant are not... Okay, L let me actually read this. And I quote, I want to make sure we are not creating the mindsets of the prophets of the New Covenant are not important. They are as essential keys to the successful church and personage in Christ. I have just found out many believers are seeking a word and no longer seeking Jesus. They are seeking the word. They are treating this exactly like the Old Testament. Well, I, I want a word from God. Open your Bible, pray, and learn the voice of the Holy Spirit, and he will give you his own word for yourself. He is, our, he is our first voice. The prophets are the confirming voice. Pastor tells another story about where he had an experience in the, with a New Testament prophet when he was a pastor of his last church. Not the current one, but his last one. I was having difficulty, he was saying, he was having difficulty with a couple who were threatening him with their finances if he did not comply to their desires. He was a young pastor and their tithe was his salary. He he was agonized about this because he loved them and knew that going back was not an option. The phone rang. It was a prophet. El Vado from Rochester. He said that the Lord showed him a house that had a tim timber sticking up and not allowing the roof to come down and sit properly. He spoke about God. He spoke the, that God said he was going to remove the timber and the wolf would come and sit correctly and the house would come into order. Immediately he felt a relief. And not many days from then, they moved and their finances never took a dip. The prophet used by Jesus aligned and brought the alignment to his heart. So the gift of the prophet of today is to do those things. Tomorrow we're going to, I'm going to see if I can finish it up and pick up from pastor and finish on with and finish it up from there so these are two gifts of the spirit and why the gifts of the spirit are very very important for today so maybe you are watching and you're like, oh, well, isn't that interesting? But you do not know Jesus. And I want to give you that chance today. And yes, this is a teaching message. These next few things are going to be teaching messages. But you do not know Jesus. The Bible tells us we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And that our, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You can never, ever be good enough for our righteousness is as filthy rags. So that is also why the Bible tells us that he will be our righteousness. Why? Our righteousness is not good enough, but his is. And because of that, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If that is you, all you have to do is pray the simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. 
forgive me of my sins. For I sinned against you. And I ask you, forgive me. Wash them right away. Wash me what is snow. For I believe that you live and died and rose again. And devil, I am through with you. You are no relation to me. Go now in Jesus' mighty name. And Father God, for anyone that prayed that prayer, right now I release a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire upon them right now. Be filled in Jesus' mighty name. Now, if you have prayed that prayer with me, there are two things I want you to do. One, go to revivaltoday.com, click on the Just Got Saved button, fill out that information. They will send you a Bible and other material. And number two, get connected to a Bible-believing, spirit-filled church because you need these gifts in your life to equip you for the work to equip you for the work of the ministry, to bring you into unity and to bring you into maturity. And of course you want a church where all these things are evident. Plus a Bible believing, spirit filled, tongue talking, Holy Ghost moving church. If you don't have one in your area, get connected to mine through live stream. His Tabernacle Family Church. Go to HisTabernacle.com. You can watch our live stream service. One, Monday, or not Monday, Sunday at 9, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and Rock Solid Faith, Tuesday nights, 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And who knows, if you get connected with them, they might be able to find you a good Bible-believing, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-moving church right in your area. So thanks for watching. We'll finish the Gifts of the Spirit tomorrow. And then Friday, we'll see how far I can get in with motivational gifts. And that is you. And the very personality that God gave you and why he gave you your personality. So thanks for watching.